All right. Well, thank you for uh, joining this evening for the second of a set of four Varroa Talks. Um, so tonight I'm going to really be trying to focus on population dynamics and monitoring so that we can really understand what this might does to our uh, bee colonies. So I'm gonna jump right in here um, and talk about monitoring. I know we have a, a diverse crowd um, this evening and you may or may not be in Ontario. Um, remembering always that um, what I talk about, what I refer to um, in general is going to be based on Ontario um, and the rules and regulations that exist here. Um, so just keeping that in mind that if you are from a different province or a different area, um, this but there might be different rules and regulations. Um, so within Ontario and within TTP, we teach uh, four different methods of monitoring for Varroa. Um, so we want to we want to make sure um, that people have different options. Um, so we teach all these different methods as a, as a, to ensure that people have uh, different ways to approach monitoring um, because it is so important. Um, now, some of the basic things about monitoring, it's really important um, that you ensure your, the colony you are testing is queen right. Um, because if you don't have brood in the colony or if, you don't, if, if your population is dwindling, um, it will affect your numbers. So it's really important to be doing a, um, a colony inspection prior to any of these methods to make sure that you have met the basic requirements for monitoring. Um, and some things with monitoring as well is being consistent is really important um, so that you have a collection of data points that are um, comparable to each other. So if you aren't familiar with monitoring, go ahead and try them all. But you, it's really best if you choose one so that way you can easily compare them across your different hives and across your different yards if you have different yards. Um, and it's really important to be thorough. You want to make sure that you are hitting a minimum of 10% of the yard or um, five colonies, um, depending obviously how many you have grouped together. And that really be thinking about um, targeting those, those higher risk colonies. You know, we always have those wonderful colonies that are booming and full of bees and really growing in a lot of brood. Those are the kind of tar the ones that we want to target to make sure um, we are understanding the, the varroa population in those really those, those growing populations. Um, and always write your numbers down. It seems like, of course, you know, I've got two hives. I'll always remember what these numbers are. You won't, you'll forget. Was it two? Was it one? Was it a hundred? You probably won't remember. So it is best to record it. Um, and that way it's easier to look back over the season and over the years, what your numbers were um, and act promptly um, and according to what you're actually seeing. Um, so I will be going into this um, about the economic thresholds. I won't be going into any treatment options today. Dan will be um, giving a great talk next week about that. Um, but I will be going a little bit into the economic thresholds and what that means. And again, these are the economic thresholds for Ontario. Um, so speaking specifically about um, the first two types of monitoring, the sugar shake and the ether roll. So uh, for the ether roll, it is, it's, it's as it, the name implies, you're using ether uh, to kill the bees and, not, and, and kill the varroa mites. Um, so you are targeting bees from the brood frames um, and that you are making sure that you're finding your queen before you do this because it is a destructive sample and you don't want to accidentally kill your queen. Um, so you want to shake those frames into a tub and scoop out about approximately 300 bees. Um, and it is important to be as precise as you can. That's why we suggest that the uh, half scoop, the half cup scoop rather, um, because it is approximately 300 bees. And it's important that you're not just guessing on the number of bees um, so that your monitoring is actually accurate. Um, and that way it's much easier to compare between your colonies. You spray three to four shots of ether into a jar, you shake it gently, rolling the jar and then you're counting varroa that stick to the jar. Um, and then you divide that number by three to get mites per 100 bee count. Um, and we do actually have videos of all of these of how to do all these monitoring methods. So um, I'm going to be going through this pretty quickly. But if you have any, um, any interest in learning how to do these, we do have videos of each of these on our YouTube channel. The sugar dust, this is a non-destructive sample, um, but it can be a little bit of a more finicky way to monitor. Um, so again, you're doing a very similar um, method where you're targeting those brood frames, you're uh, shaking two frames into a tub, you're gathering up approximately those 300 bees, and then you're um, putting them into a jar which has a screened lid that you can um, pour one tablespoon of powdered sugar through it. You're gently shaking 
um, the, that jar to coat the bees and letting it sit in the sun for five minutes. And this is where the finicky part gets in is if it, it's not a really sunny day, if it's not a really warm day, um, it can be a less accurate method. So it's just keeping it in mind um, that you really want to be using this method under ideal situations. And then you're emptying that sugar through the screen into a, a tub, dissolving that sugar and counting up the mites in your tub. And again, you're dividing it by three to get mites per hundred bee count. Uh, the next two methods that I'm just going to go through very briefly is the sticky board and the alcohol wash. And um, you'll find these two types of methods of monitoring methods coming up a few times during my talks um, because they appear most frequently in research. Uh, these two methods are used most frequently in research. Um, so the alcohol wash, again, very similar method in terms of which bees you're targeting, how many bees you're targeting, except this time you are using uh, alcohol or some, some kind of you know, windshield wiper fluid, that type of thing. Um, it is recommended that you shake the bees for 30 minutes. Uh, however, not most beekeepers don't have the time to sit in a bee yard shaking a jar for 30 minutes. So we recommend that you set it to the side, finish uh, your inspection, close up your colony, move on to the next, and then come back to it. And all that um, time does is allow for the mites to be killed and to fall off the backs of the bees. So again, that you get that accurate number where you're going to be counting all the mites that fall off um, your bees and you're dividing that by three to get the mites per hundred bee count. Uh, the sticky board, this method is uh, quite a bit different from the other three um, because it does require a screened bottom board under your hive um, to allow basically for a natural mite fall um, and that you create a sticky board. You can buy these now commercially quite easily um, or you can make one yourself, just a grid on a, a file folder with some sticky Crisco or something like that um, and that you're placing that sticky board underneath the hive, you're leaving it for three days. And after the third day, you go back and remove that sticky board and count all the mites on the board. And then you're dividing um, the number of mites by three to get the mite drop for 24 hours. So that, this is where the economic threshold comes in that I was referring to earlier. And um, you can locate this table on the OMAFRA website, which is the, the, the government website. So if you Google OMAFRA and thresholds, honeybees, something like that, this will come up. Um, and it's really important to note the method have different number of row mites in the spring and different number of row mites in the late summer. So it's really important. That's where that consistency and um, your writing everything down is really important um, because your ether roll has a different economic threshold from your alcohol wash, which is different from your sticky board. Um, and always remembering that it's within the context of 100 bees or 24 hour mite drop. Um, and you can see that the levels are fairly low in uh, in May. So one mite per 100 bees for the ether roll, two mites per 100 bees for the alcohol wash, and nine mites for 24 hours for the sticky board. So it's really critical that you've made all the effort to monitor your colonies, make sure that you're actually collecting accurate information, keeping track that you actually have divided it by three um, to get the accurate threshold number. Um, now that you have these numbers, what exactly does it mean to your colony? You're like, everyone knows varroa mites are bad for your colony, but okay, I've done the monitoring, I, I have mites, what do I do with this information? Right, so it's really critical to understand varroa mite biology. Don't be thrown off too much about how busy this graphic is. It's really just to illustrate visually the life cycle of the mite and how tightly linked it is with, with the honeybee brood. Um, and a few key things to note so that you can see um, in that on the right hand side, you can see the uh, nurse bee. She's tending to the larva. That's that founder's mite jumping off into the larva. She's going to hide in the bottom of that cell until it is capped over, and that's when that reproduction starts. And what's worth noting, right, is you can see the development of that honeybee along with the founder's mite laying her own brood, um, laying her own eggs, and the development into more varroa mites. And you can see that um, just even a few extra days can make a difference. So on the top left, you've got that emerging uh, worker bee with a few mites on her back, and then you can see that uh, drone uh, be emerging with a few more mites on his back. Um, so it, the, the life cycle of that varroa mite is so tightly linked with the development and the amount of brood that is present in your colony.
So um, the basic math of Varroa. Uh, when a founder's mite jumps in to that um, cell, she is going to be laying approximately six eggs. And that one to two of those will be adult females produced um, from those eggs into fertile females emerging with that young worker bee. And then it, the potential for two to three adult females to be produced on that drone group. And don't forget that foundress mite also comes out. So every time you have that worker bee emerging, you have two, potentially three fertile varroa mites coming out with three to four fertile varroa mites coming out of, out of every successful drone brood. So, um, and uh, noting as well, that the, the nurse bees um, have led to some really interesting varroa behavior. Um, she et al. from 2016 actually showed a preference for the varroa for nurse bees during that phoretic phase. And the reason that this is important is that they think it's based around nutrition and that the varroa mites are actually planning their, uh, their exit from, the, um, from that the, the worker cell emerging, say, um, she's going to have those mites on her back. They're going to be in that phoretic phase, but they actually don't stay on that newly emerged bee. They actually have a preference for those worker bees and time their exit and jump on to these nurse bees rather than those newly emerged bees versus those, uh, those forager bees as well. So varroa mites actually do have their own behavior and are able to quote unquote plan um, their future reproduction by ensuring that they jump onto those nurse bees, they're getting that really great nutrition from those fat bodies on the, um, on the body of those worker bees, those nurse bees, and then they also increase their chance of successfully being able to find an opportunity to jump back into that perfectly timed cell right before it's capped to start that reproductive cycle all over again. So not only do you just have pure chance of Varroa finding their next opportunity to reproduce, you also have this opportunity um, because they're specifically looking for those nurse bees to have their phoretic phase on. So it, is, it's, it really opens your eyes that Varroa mites aren't just blindly living in a colony, they actually do have uh, a very successful way of increasing their reproduction. Um, so just going um, really quickly back to the same graphic again is to just show show you that um, that the the difference between that worker bee and the drone bee can make a, tr a tremendous difference to the overall population. So keeping in the back of your mind as a beekeeper going into your colonies, how much drone brood do you want uh, in those colonies and and really thinking about the impact they can have on the magnitude of the varroa population. Um, so, in terms of the, the ability to kind of give you numbers and understand what the how the varroa population grows, um, if I just give you a totally imaginary example colony, you know, comes out it's springtime, it's it's early April, you have what fifteen thousand workers in a colony, and if you were to have at that point in time in April a one percent infestation rate, right? low infestation rate relatively to everything, that would equate to approximately 150 mites in your whole colony. Mites now do on average, approximately have a 15% infertility rate. So that would mean approximately 127 fertile foundress mites right at the beginning of the season. We haven't really produced any brood yet. This is right at the beginning of the season. So you've got approximately 127 of those fertile founders mites. Um, now this picture, just to, to note as well, is um, the this brown one on the bottom, that is a mature female. She is going to have the ability to reproduce. Whereas the one next to her, that's the a white one. Um, she isn't um, fertile and she's not fully mature. So if that worker bee emerges um, with the, the brown ones and the white ones on her back, it's only going to be those mature brown females are actually going to be able to keep reproducing. So just kind of keeping that in the back of your mind that not all uh, varroa mites are going to be able to be successful in their reproduction, um, but that's just kind of to give you the basic math to start. So in terms of a colony, again, vague just guessing at numbers, you know, 15,000 worker bees in a, in a colony in April grows to 22,000 in May, 
oh, sorry, I forget the numbers here. As I'll just move this around. 44,000 in June and 60,000 workers in Hive in July. We've got a booming, full, functional, completely uh, wonderful Hive in July. That's exactly what we want as beekeepers. That's the kind of projection that we want to see and that growth that we want to see in our colonies. So don't, again, worry too much about these numbers. Um, but remember that 127 founders mites are just present in the colony. And if they each have two reproductive cycles and they're able to reproduce 1.5 mature females by the time this worker bee emerges. Now, again, keeping in the back of your mind, I'm only talking about worker bees emerging and I'm only giving these founders mites two reproductive cycles. They actually can reproduce three or four times given the right conditions, but this is just to kind of keep it conservative. So I just worked out very rough math to give you an idea of what we mean by exponential growth of varroa population. So you can see we start with that 127 mites in on April 1st, they double, but then any um, successful mites that emerge with those worker bees, they're also doubling. And then you have that happening every single time. Uh, right, April 30th, going into May, going to June, going to July. So you might have started with a really low or, you know, you're happy, you're satisfied as a beekeeper, it's a low enough level that I, I'm not concerned about it. But then you very quickly move from 3% to 6.5% to in July, 43% mite infestation. Now, these are all just um, a vague, simple mathematical numbers that I'm just calculating. But 43% growth like this under the right circumstances can occur. Completely unchecked successful mite reproduction can lead you to have a absolutely unsustainable level of, of mites in your colony very, very quickly. Because we're only talking July, right? That is still height of the honey producing season here in Ontario. And that a 43% infestation rate, you as a beekeeper are gonna start to see some serious problems. Um, if your, your varroa mites get to that level. Um, and so this is the very simplified graph of what we mean by that exponential growth. And that's what those numbers are showing. Because you're constantly doubling and each of the new reproductive female varroa mites that are becoming new founders mites, this is how you get to these absolute, these crashes mid-season, crashes late season, right? The um, top line, which I think is green or at least a dark color, the top line, that natural curve, that's your honeybee population, right? That's what we expect. It starts a little bit low in, um, in, the, in the spring. And then we have that huge peak towards July, right? That, those are the big booming colonies. Those are the ones who are gonna bring us our honey. But then obviously it starts to dwindle as we approach the late summer and the fall, where we're really focusing on, on our wintering ability. But that red line there, as you can see, is um, your percent infestation. So the actual mite population, it's not increasing to this absolutely crazy level, but you don't need an absolutely crazy level for that percent infestation to suddenly skyrocket. And this is why a lot of beekeepers feel kind of caught off guard sometimes. They feel like, oh, there was a huge spike in my, my varroa infestation because they didn't monitor until say September 1st, right? On this chart, you can see the mite infestation is already well above your threshold and is causing enormous economic damage, let alone just simple damage to the health of that colony. Um, and it's also about proportion. If you think about where your bees are on that, that downward curve, right? Your colony is shrinking because your brood is shrinking because they're not thinking about brood production anymore. They're just thinking about surviving the winter, right? And so proportionally, your number of bees start to decrease as the amount of cap brood decreases. And what happens when you lose your cap brood in a colony? Your varroa mites come out, right? And they move into their phoretic phase. So beekeepers are seeing this spike in varroa when all it is is the varroa that's already present is coming out of that brood capping and really doing a lot of damage to those bees going into that critical winter period. So do thresholds even matter, right? This is a question we get quite a lot at TTP. If I'm going to treat anyway, do thresholds even matter? And I will show you many examples here today about how timing 
is everything. If you weren't able to make it to uh, Glennis's talk on Wednesday, or Wednesday, Tuesday, rather, um, she talked a lot about uh, transmission of viruses, um, how viral mites weaken the colonies with um, and impact the immune response of the, the colony, and about really considering those potential impacts for na on native pollinators and other bee colonies nearby. So the in, when you see that spike in varroa in the fall, the damage might have already been done. And you as a beekeeper might not be able to act in time in order to save that colony. That's why timing is everything. And that's why monitoring throughout the season, being really consistent will give you those flags and help you make management decisions so that you aren't scrambling at the end of the season, really struggling with varroa because it really is important to be gathering that information throughout the entire season. Okay. Um, so in terms of varroa and winter losses, you know, like, like I, I threw my treatments on, I think everything is fine, right? That That's for a long time, what a, a lot of us beekeepers were doing was, you know, we're fall, we, we know varroa is bad, we're treating, we're, we're doing what we think we need to. Um, but this work, um, out of the University of Wealth um, was a really important paper um, because it showed a, a very important link between Varroa and winter colony losses. Um, obviously, there's not any simple answer to it, um, but the research that they were doing um, was they were actually taking Varroa mite levels very late in the season, much later than you ever would as a beekeeper, late October, mid-November. But they were actually able to divide the colonies they had in this research into two kind of categories a low category and a high category. Um, and it, all it was was about the idea that if you were in the high um, category, 85% of the colony mortality was actually associated with that higher varroa level. But if the colony had a slightly lower varroa infestation or much lower varroa infestation, they had a much higher chance of surviving the winter. So it just showed very nicely the importance, the simple link that if you if the mite levels get too high, especially late in the season, you're going to have winter colony loss. Um, and that keeping in mind that the thresholds are a guide. Nothing is perfect here. We're not perfect as beekeepers, you're not perfectly counting out up 300 bees. They are an estimate and to guide your decision making. And that remembering that as that cap brood um, amount shrinks, those mites are moving into that phoretic phase, right? So timing really is important to understand, okay, where am I on that graph? Where are my bees on that graph? And where are my varroa on that graph, right? And having that information from early in the season so that you can chart the varroa progress as your your colony brood shrinks is really going to help you interpret what those monitoring numbers mean and that another thing that that um, Guzman paper from the University of Guelph showed was that you need to be prepared to lose 42 percent of your honeybee pop population and to to use uh, these 47 percent of the food reserves so if you're putting your colony into winter is the cluster big enough to actually be able to lose 42% of that bee population in order to still be healthy in the spring and be able to bounce back and start to be successfully reproducing, um, producing that brood again. So it's really about thinking uh, ahead of time as well that, okay, I've done everything I've monitored, I've treated when it was appropriate and I've gone into winter. And yes, I can, I can afford to lose that huge amount of bees because all colonies lose a large number of those worker bees over winter. And that's why it's so important to be going in, to not just a large cluster, but a large cluster of healthy bees that haven't been pulled down and had viruses and just a weakened immune system by Varroa throughout the entire season. Um, so there we go. And speaking of winter bees, the, the uh, such incredible importance of winter bees um, that uh, this research actually was done, I can't believe it, it's 21 years ago, my goodness. Um, so this work was done in Canada, um, it was done in Manitoba, um, but it actually shows very well uh, the importance of winter bees. So we think, you know, winter doesn't, doesn't happen till December, right? That's, 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 that's a thing, except our honeybee colonies are starting to produce winter bees in August. Right. And if you only are monitoring once a year, right at the end of the season in September, you, your winter bees are already being produced at that time. 
So that Matilda et al. 2001 paper was showing was that 60% of the cohort were still those high mortality summer bees, but 40% of the bees being produced at that time at the end of August had markedly reduced mortality, indicating they were um, they were winter bees. Um, so that they actually saw some of those um, that August cohort live all the way into May. So you can imagine that if your honeybees that are being produced are being produced with a huge amount of pressure from having a lot of founders mites in those capped root cells, well, are they going to be able to survive until May? Are they, is there, are they going to have, be strong enough and have an immune response and be healthy enough to get through all those really harsh winter months? So it's also about keeping in your back of your mind as a beekeeper that, oh yeah, monitoring before August when I already, you know, August, September, October time, Maybe I want to be monitoring sooner or actually, you know what, maybe I want to be monitoring all the way from spring all the way through so that I have the ability to interrupt uh, the the rearing cycle of the rearing cycle, the um, the reproductive cycle of Varroa mites um, so that I don't harm those winter bees because they are so important. Um, so the and as time goes on, that. Um, proportion shifts the higher and higher uh, bee, as, as in they have a reduced mortality, so that they are your winter bees as time goes on. So you think about those bees that are produced in the third, fourth uh, week of September, and then even into October, possibly, that that brood is emerging, and that you don't want your bees to be emerging sick and weak and uh, going into winter, because having a whole bunch of sick bees isn't going to make the difference to the to your survival. You really need your bees to be healthy when they are emerging. Um, so in terms of real world example of row growth, uh, at TTP in 2018 and 2019, um, we were doing a mid-season treatment data. So I thought I would uh, snag the data from this work um, that was collected through sticky boards. Um, so that's where the uh, you calculate the average number of mites per 24 hour period. You're putting that sticky board underneath the hive, you're leaving it for three days and you're taking it out and counting up all the varroa mites as a natural mite fall. Um, so we collected this data. We It's a royal we at TTP. I did not take part of this work, but TTP did. And um, in August and September of 2018 and 2019, that critical time when those winter bees are being produced to try and understand we had control colonies um, that weren't treated. And then we had um, obviously treatment colonies that we could compare that varroa growth with. So some of the really interesting things that I was able to pull out of this data is that um, the uh, 2019 data, which is the red line that you're seeing, and the 2018 data, which is the blue line that you're seeing, um, they started at completely different levels. It actually blew my mind. You can see that red line, the mites per 24 hours, is really low. It's near zero. It's not completely zero, but it's near zero. Whereas you can see in 2018, mite levels were much higher at this time of year. So keep that in the back of your mind as a beekeeper is that every year is different. Just because 2021 is probably going to go down as a terrible year for Varroa, we don't know what 2022 is going to bring. So it's really important not to just assume that what you did last year is going to work what you did this year. Because if you hadn't monitored, say, until the 11th of September. Look at the difference in those varroa levels. And as you as a beekeeper, wouldn't you want to act maybe August 1st in 2018, rather than waiting all the way to September and having very high levels that are well above your economic threshold, right? Keeping in mind that economic threshold is where we already know damage is being done in a monetary way to your colony. Um, so in terms of, this is the 2018 mite growth, um, and the blue line is that control um, hive, the untreated hive, and that orange line is one where formic was applied. Um, and again, it's the same, it's the mites per 24 um, hour drop, and you can see that because the formic was applied at that mid-August time point, or just before this mid-August time point, you can see the huge spike in mites dropping, right? Because the formic is doing its job. It is um, bringing that mite population down um, and uh, helping keep the colony healthier. And you can see that um, even though that, that treatment was applied, you can see that that 
the rural population really starts to decrease. So you can see even before that September 11th date, you can see how it continues to, to go down and then plateau. Whereas the untreated colony um, has a relatively steady climb, but then you can really start to see, because remember that September time is where you have lots of worker bees, uh, but your brood is starting to shrink. The amount of cap brood is going to start to shrink and that you're gonna have a lot more mites coming out of those cap cells and not been able to successfully jump back in, really move into those, um, that, that phoretic phase. Um, so you can see how timing is everything in this situation, right? Is that applying your treatment early enough to stop that damage because of these really important winter bees that are gonna to start to, to, to emerge and acting. And if you don't have that information, you can't act in time. If you only plan on, on monitoring in September, a lot of damage could have been, been done and you could already have a weakened collapsing hive. So that's why we always recommend keep doing monitoring throughout the season if you can, keeping track of that so that you can um, get those signals and act because you don't know what your year is going to bring if you don't actually gather that data. So for 2019, the, because of the huge difference in the mite levels, I put the two graphs on with the same y-axis. It's obviously not going to work for 2019 because the levels were so much lower than 2018. So that's where this is the 100 mites per 24 hours. Um, and it, it, it made it for a really difficult to interpret graph. So I just wanted to really point out that huge difference between 2018 and 2019. Now you can see I've swapped my Y axis to 12 mites per 24 hours um, compared to the 100, which was an appropriate scale for 2018. So it gives you that idea again. Um, the mite levels, they're not crazy, right? They're actually quite low, but Formic still helped create that mic drop in mid-August and continue to suppress that population as those bees emerge, we go into our winter phase, we are having healthy bees emerging because they are not um, having a virus is vectored, they're not having their immune system weakened by varroa mites being present. Um, so even when your varroa mite level population has remained very low and maybe like at or below economic threshold, it can still be doing damage even when it's low. So you can still see the benefit of treating and that timely application of the treatment. Um, it can also be really critical to helping you successfully get those healthy cluster so that you can have a successful spring. So is it only varroa levels that we need to worry about, right? I've been harping on and on and on about monitoring and getting your varroa levels and understanding the economic thresholds, but is that all the, the, that I need to worry about? Is yes, varroa is, sorry, yes, varroa is a, um, is a big deal, but unfortunately it is not the only thing we need to worry about. Like I keep referring to is that varroa uh, will, vector viruses, but any kind of stress, even environmental stress, um, can impact the colony and the varroa population. So um, some, uh, a, a paper, it's a little bit convoluted, um, but a very recent paper came out and it actually reflected what I and many other people were seeing in 2021. Um, oh, sorry. I, I, I look seed, I have, a, I have a typo there. So they basically looked at varroa abundance in the fall and that they found that it was really driven about the, pop, the honeybee population dynamics earlier in the season and how that was linked to the environmental temperature conditions. Um, so they, the way that they were, they were um, uh, trying to explain this phenomenon was that the raised temperatures, so such as in 2021, right, we did have quite high temperatures, a very early mild spring, that reinforces the varroa infestation um, because of that bee abundance and brood availability. Remembering again that those big booming colonies in July, if you think back to the part of the talk where I gave you those imaginary numbers um, and I doubled the varroa um, uh, population each time, is that those big booming colonies 
are the ones you want, but they're the ones you worry about because it drives the colony of losses. Because you have all of this cap brood very early available, but every time you have cap brood, you have early reproducing. And that the results showed clearly that the abundance of mites was positively correlated with the abundance of the cat brood and bees in the fall, right? Is because you had that growth and population of your bees, but also of your varroa mites as you go along. And so that's where timing, uh, being strategic as a beekeeper, really looking at your various colonies and deciding which ones are the right ones to test, which conditions are met whether is it queen right? Is it have lots of cat brood? Does it have lots of bees? Is this the right colony to be testing? And what does it mean when I get a number back? Um, because it, they are so tightly linked together that, that honeybee reproduction and varroa uh, reproduction is very tightly linked because they need that cat brood phase. And that it's not just us as beekeepers noticing it here in Canada, it actually is around the world is that these, there are many factors that come together and can lead to these awesome strong colonies who have a huge rural population in them. Um, so speaking specifically about that, okay, varroa is bad, I get that, I need to deal with that. But keeping in the back of your, of your mind that any additional stressors will also reduce the ability for your honeybees to deal with the varroa infestation. So when the economic thresholds were actually uh, developed, um, they were developed based on a bunch of different research, but some of it was done by Rob Curry uh, in 2008 in, in Manitoba. And what he was looking at was varroa mites with the presence of tracheal mites. So not just varroa mites, but that additional stress of varroa mites. And what he showed was that as soon as the mite level went above 1%, um, and this, in this case, it was alcohol washes. So that was below the economic threshold because you had the secondary stressor in the spring, you already were increasing your economic loss. Um, so you're now having to think about multiple things as a beekeeper. You're not just worrying about your varroa levels. You're also trying to assess, does my colony have uh, nutritional stress? Does it have uh, weather stress? Is it, you know, is, is there enough forage? Is there all of these things you do need to be considering because just like someone, if I have, if I already have one disease, if I then encounter a cold, I'm more likely to catch that cold, more likely to suffer from that cold because I already have some a pre-existing condition. So if you have uh, varroa in your colony, you know that's already doing harm to your bees, and then add a secondary stressor, like in this example of tracheal mice. Well, then the bees are extra struggling to deal with all of these things and remain healthy and been able to produce that great amount of fruit. Um, so what uh, Rob Curry showed actually was that you were actually getting losses of honey. So we're have, this is where that economic threshold and that economic impact comes in, is that they were actually noticing losses of honey at relatively low amounts, but in that peak of the season. So if that varroa levels count, if you're not monitoring, or if you're monitoring and not actually acting and you're not keeping that varroa population down, whether it's three and a half percent or 7% or 29%, um, you're having an, a, a honey loss. So you're already, you're, it's already hitting your wallet right there. Um, and then if you allow the varroa population to continue growing at such a rate, you're getting those losses in the fall right, is that uh, we had a lot of beekeepers phone us this past fall and say, I went to put on my oxalic acid drizzle and the colony, <coughs> excuse me, the colony was already dead. So that's what is meant by those fall losses is that those bees are collapsing. Um, so the, so you're experiencing those fall colony losses. You can see those, those high mite levels. Um, you're experiencing those co colony losses. So not only have you lost uh, money through uh, a reduced honey crop, you potentially have lost your, um, you've lost your entire colony, and then worse, the winter losses, right, is it's very easy for us to add up because it's a very defined point, you're in the spring, um, and your colonies are dead, but those numbers, how, how many colonies you're losing, um, and how many colonies in the spring you come out with, are a much bigger number. So you can see that impact of that varroa levels just climbing, climbing, climbing. There really is an impact on you as a beekeeper, 
let alone what's actually happening in the colony. So it's very important to be um, to understand that economic threshold is that it's not just about, oh, you know, I, I want to have the biggest honey crop I can. It's also about the health of your bees and your your own success as a beekeeper to get those colonies through to spring. So in terms of to sum it all up, um, going back to the beginning here, we have uh, at TTV, we teach four different monitoring methods. And if you're not familiar with them, again, go to that YouTube channel and have a look at our various videos um, and find one that works for you and your operation. It's uh, There's no perfect solution. They are just estimates. But the more you do them, the more you become familiar with them, the more you will be able to use that information to make those management decisions. And that Thinking back to those Varroa levels in 2018 versus 2019, how important in 2018 in particular to be monitoring throughout the season, not just in the fall, because maybe you would have wanted to do a mid-season treatment or do something else or split or uh, do cultural management techniques. There's so many things that you can do as a beekeeper to be slowing that Varroa population growth, um, but you don't know that if you don't monitor right? That's where that knowledge is power um, idea comes in. If it's 2019 and those levels stay low, 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 you're just reassuring yourself as a beekeeper that everything is still good in the colony. But without that monitoring, you don't know, you are just guessing. And so that's why it's so important to be taking that time and figuring out how to integrate that monitoring method into your operation so that you're always doing it and just becomes part of what you do. So that it's because some years you do need to treat earlier, but you can't know that if you aren't monitoring. So it can really help guide those decisions about what treatments you want to use and when you want to use them because you have that data. And so the importance of that winter bee cluster, those different um, research papers really showed that the winter bees are coming out so early and that we want them to be strong and healthy and not be pulled down by a very high varroa infestation levels. Um, and just because you get 0% doesn't mean everything is fine. It just means that you're not detecting them so that um, varroa is going to be 50, between 50% 50 and 90% of the varroa population is going to be reproducing underneath the cappings at any given time in the summer. Um, so that a 0% doesn't mean you have no varroa. It doesn't mean everything's okay. It just means, okay, that I got a zero this time. I'm going to keep monitoring, keep doing this so that I can catch those times where those, those varroa mites do start to come up. And that it's really about using all the tools in your tool belt to slow down that exponential growth, right? That, that classic growth of the varroa going from, <clears throat> going from a, a low, relatively harmless level, but all of a sudden appearing to spike in the fall, right? It's not about spiking. It's about that the proportion of bees and the proportion of cat's brood shrinking and the varroa mites moving to their phoretic phase. So thinking hard about your varroa population, what is what's re, how they reproduce and what phase they are going to be and what your monitoring levels are uh, telling you. And that's why you have the different economic thresholds in the spring versus the uh, the late summer. So that you they the two numbers mean different things because your varroa population is doing different things. So understanding how the honeybee reproduces is important because it's tightly linked with your varroa, but also really not underestimating the varroa themselves. They do want to survive and they want to um, increase their numbers, right? They are an animal themselves and they do want to keep going, but they keep going by harming our honeybees. And that when we can keep that population down, then we can have a much lower winter loss. And that it's so important that we don't um, have these, uh, we don't invest our time and our money to only have to lose our colony in the fall or over winter. So really thinking hard about what that population dynamic means um, and what it means at different times of the year and just arming yourself with as much information as possible. Um, so I'll take some time. We've got loads of time for questions. I seem to have uh, blown through that presentation. Hopefully I didn't go too fast for people. Um, but just reminding you as well um, that I didn't cover obviously any treatments today um, and that 
it's really um, uh, Dan Borges on Tuesday will be um, we'll be talking about treatments mode of action. It's a really interesting talk about how our various treatments impact for all mites and how it works, um, as well as um, the genetic. Uh, selection program and the ways that you can use cultural controls will be covered by Kelsey Ducharme on Thursday. Um, so if now I've got you all worried about your Varroa population, what it means for your, your honeybees in the spring, and you're, you're trying to come up with your, your integrated pest management plan, that's a great place to be. And I would really encourage you to join us next week uh, so that you can continue that understanding and how to apply those treatments.